All right, so I want to start a new unit with this lecture, and, and that's going to be uh, electricity. And specifically, we're going to start uh, smaller with this unit. Um, well, it doesn't have to be smaller, but it, it can be, and that's something called electrostatics. And, and you've heard of this as uh, static electricity or static charges. Um, we're going to start uh, very small with an atom. And so we'll have to think back to chemistry class. Um, we learned that atoms are made up of neutrons and protons. And I'll go with the symbol of capital N for a neutron and capital P for a proton. And I'll just go four of these here. This is going to be the center of the atom, and we'll call this the nucleus. So we learned last year in chemistry class that uh, the neutrons and protons were located in the nucleus. Um, this is also where uh, uh, the atom's mass is, right? Because uh, the neutrons and protons um, have a mass of, uh, I think we always like to think of them as a mass of uh, one, and uh, and that's how we would come up with the atomic mass. But um, we're going to get a little more specific than that, what exactly that mass is in kilograms, and so on, and talk a little bit about size, right? Because I think maybe last year you drew your atom kind of like this, with a nucleus in the center, and these electrons out here orbiting around kind of like a solar system, right? Just flying around. And maybe I'll have a second electron out here as well. And so this atom uh, has a name, right? What kind of element it is. And, and that comes from the atomic number. So the atomic number is equal to the proton number. And this gives an atom its name. And so uh, two protons, does anybody remember what that is? Hopefully you do. Uh, it's helium. HE is the chemical symbol for helium. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, what else do we want to say about that? Um, the size of this atom, I heard it best explained uh, this way. Even though we draw an atom like this, and we think, okay, the electrons are, are, are right here, and the nucleus is right here, and because um, the neutrons and protons have a mass of, of, of one, and we usually ignore the mass of the electrons, we'll talk about why that is later, uh, that, that this was all the mass was located in the nucleus, right? And um, so this might have an atomic weight of four and ignoring these electrons. Okay, uh, well, in reality, the size of this atom is a little deceiving because even though we know atoms are very small, we can think of the size of the nucleus compared to the rest of the atom as being similar uh, to, let's say you were to go to Michigan football stadium and you were to walk into the center of the stadium take out a marble, um, maybe this size, right, and hold it in the center of uh, the football stadium. And if you did that in a giant football stadium that sits 100,000 people, that marble would be the size of the nucleus, and the rest of the football stadium would be the size of the atom. And you might say, that's crazy, right? Because how could that be? You know, atoms make up matter. Uh, they, um, get, they have mass. How can, how can that be true, right? Because if that was true, that would mean that most of the atom was what? What would be most of the atom? Well, the marble is the mass. The electrons are flying around somewhere, and, and they're kind of insignificant in, in mass, right, compared to the nucleus, at least, compared to that marble. So what is in the rest of the football stadium? And, and you know, in this sense, this is just one giant empty stadium. We would say space. Right? So that would mean most of an atom is empty space. 
Okay, so there must be some forces there going on that if, if everything is atoms and, and, er, and atoms are mostly space, there must be some forces there that stop us from just like collapsing on ourselves, right? That, that, that holds us together because uh, otherwise, how could that be true? Um, when we draw our atoms, the, uh, the charge on the atom is the uh, protons uh, and, and the electron number is where we get our charge from. So we learned that protons had a relative charge of positive one, the electrons had a relative charge of uh, negative one. So here we'd say plus one, plus one, neutrons is zero, zero, uh, negative one, negative one, we would say this is a neutral helium atom. Um, a charged atom was, was different, right? Something was, was different about a charged atom. And, and we called that an ion. But specifically, how did we get an ion, right? If, if the proton number gives the, the element its name or the atom its name, then we weren't changing the proton number, right? And, and this kind of gets at an idea here that to create an ion, we, uh, we changed the electron number. And if you think about that, chemistry was all about that, right? It was always about electrons. Like, why do, why do chemical reactions happen? Well, because of electron, electrons. Think about covalent bonds. Why do uh, different atoms bond uh, to other atoms to create a covalent bond? Because they want to share electrons. An ionic bond, they share unevenly. Hydrogen bonding, a slight attraction of electrons. Um, it was it was all over the place. Uh, redox reactions, right? Uh, reduction and oxidation. Why did that happen? Because of electrons, right? Uh, reduction, electrons is gained, right? I think is what it was. Uh, oxidation is lost, electron, uh, and uh, reduction is gained. And and so um, everything was all about electron movement. And in physics, it's not all that different, right? Because here, what is going to happen? To, uh, to give something a charge is, is going to be based on electrons. So, uh, and, and, and so what we're going to do is, is think about, well, what is going to change here? What can we change to create ions? We can't uh, change the protons easily because they're in the nucleus. And so what we're going to do is these electrons are floating around out here. They're flying around somewhere. And because they're on the outer edges of the atom, they can be scraped off uh, with friction or, or with uh, some kind of uh, interaction with another surface and these electrons can change objects and give something a charge. So uh, um, our electrons are what is going to uh, allow for charge. And I guess I can write that right over here. But that kind of gets at the idea that the, the, um, the basic unit of charge is going to be an electron, right? Uh, I guess I can write that as the fundamental unit, the basic unit. And I'm going to come back to that in a second here. And you might be sitting there saying, well, what about neutrons, right? We didn't talk about neutrons. Well, the neutron number can be different. Um, let's think about uh, a couple things here. Um, let's, let's look at an atom like hydrogen, right? Uh, hydrogen, if we were to look on the periodic table, might look like this. Right. And 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 what we have here is uh, and, and maybe carbon would look like this. And maybe oxygen look like this. And this is definitely not 16, right? It's 15.9994. All right, uh, and, and, and so why is that? Where do these numbers come from? Well, what we had here uh, with this, with each element, 
um, element, hydrogen is an element, carbon is an atom, or is an element, oxygen is an element. We the smallest unit of an element was an atom. All right, and and what we said here is that this was our atomic number. So this gave hydrogen its name. And you might say, well, what was this? Well, this was some kind of weight, right? Maybe you referred to it as molecular weight or atomic weight. Correctly here, atomic weight, right? Uh, a molecule is just something that consists of multiple atoms. And so uh, we are just going to say atomic weight because we only have, we're only interested in one atom right now. Um, so no molecules. Uh, but but this 1.00794, where did that come from, right? And, and, and where it came from is a different number of neutrons, right? Because, uh, and, and, and how could that be, right? Well, there's something called isotopes. And, and this is when um, you have the same, same element, So the proton number, right? But a different number of neutrons. And and so let's use an example, right? Kind of running out of room here. An example of this would be with hydrogen which has a couple isotopes that are worth knowing. Um, if I drew, we'll say we have hydrogen one, which is just our uh, hydrogen atom without, um, without any, uh, without any, um, without any uh, <clears throat> neutrons, right? And, and then we'll have hydrogen two, with one neutron, so um, ugh, I'm gonna keep my one up here for hydrogen. Th this is seen multiple ways um, when they write this online or on, on in, in different periodic tables and whatnot. So uh, let me let me try and keep this consistent, right? Like I already picked a method of of writing this. So I'm gonna put atomic number here, molecular or atomic weight here. So let me try that one more time. So we'll put the one there for hydrogen and then a one right here because we'll say the first isotope doesn't have any doesn't have any uh, neutrons. And the second isotope of hydrogen still hydrogen, right? So it has one proton. Uh, has one neutron, right? So it has an atomic weight of two. Now you might say, what are the units on that two? Well, that's a little more complicated, right? That gets back to how they picked 12 grams of carbon 12 and decided that that would have a weight of uh, 12 and then going backwards found that hydrogen would have a, a weight of one. Um, it's, yeah, that, that's, a, that's they, they built a uh, relative uh, mass scale for the periodic table. Okay, so anyways, um, and we'll go right here with uh, hydrogen three. So um, these different isotopes, they're all hydrogen, right? They all have one proton, but we can see that uh, this hydrogen has zero neutrons. And I'm pretty sure this isotope has a name. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, this one has one neutron. And you might say, well, isn't it just called hydrogen one, hydrogen two, hydrogen three? Sure. But I think it also has a, 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 uh, a more a name like this, deuterium for hydrogen two and tritium for hydrogen three. And hydrogen three has one proton, so these other two masses have to come from uh, two neutrons. All right, and so here we can see uh, three different isotopes. Now the reason I bring this up is because, well, if you go back to the element hydrogen, you see this 1.00794, not one. You see here for carbon, 12.0107, not 12. You see for oxygen, 
uh, 15.9994. Um, why not just 16? Why not 12? Why not 1? Why does it got to be complicated? This is because the atomic weight is a weighted average of what? Of uh, the relative amount on Earth. And so why that's useful is this. If we have uh, hydrogen, an element, the element hydrogen, we know that on Earth, that even though there is, uh, that, well, we know this, first of all, that most of hydrogen is going to have, is going to have an atomic weight of what? Well, what's this very close to? It's close to one. So mostly we have this isotope. However, it's a little bit above one. So that means we also have uh, isotopes with uh, more neutrons, right? So uh, we get um, deuterium and tritium this way. Uh, I guess you could say the opposite for oxygen, right? That, that, that even though it has uh, eight protons, eight electrons, eight neutrons, um, eight protons pro plus eight neutrons gives you 16, and electrons we don't really worry about uh, because they're a thousand times less massive. Um, so um, why this 15.994? Well, obviously there must be an isotope of oxygen with an atomic weight of maybe 15 or 14. Now there's not very much of it, and so it's only slightly under 16, but, but it's definitely there. Right, and, and, and carbon should have some above 12, right? Think back to biology class, carbon 13, carbon 14, right? I think we had carbon dating in biology class and, and that, that carbon was radioactive and, and decayed at a certain rate and that's how we knew um, uh, when something had died, right? Because it stopped uh, putting more carbon into its body with food and, and we could see based on how much carbon was in its body uh, when the last time that it had had eaten or when it was alive because of how the how much the carbon had 13 had decayed into carbon 12 right into a stabler form so uh, this is this is the idea here so neutrons do not matter so much in our um, in, in, in electrostatics but I just wanted to bring up what they're useful for and what isotopes are okay so moving on <clears throat> why uh, why talk about uh, uh, the, the 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 atom right because the fundamental unit of charge is going to be an electron so uh, let's look at fluorine for a second right and let me get a blank sheet of paper all right so fluorine I'm just picking fluorine I could have picked any element uh, fluorine is uh, a halogen it's it's in the, I think, the seventh column. Um, and uh, anyways, uh, it is, uh, it has a minus one charge is what it likes. And, and what I want to bring up here is the, the, it's one of its ions that it likes to take is, is a minus one, right? Fluorine likes to gain one electron and become fluoride. And so this would be fluoride. Fluorine does not like to lose an electron and, and, and look like this, right, as a positive one. So we either see fluorine like this or fluoride. Um, and, and so anyways, how does this happen, right? Well, fluorine has, uh, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head if it's uh, seven uh, uh, electrons. Um, I, th I think that sounds wrong. Um, but, but, but the point is this, right? Fluorine is neutral right here. So how does it become uh, fluoride? How does it become fluorine with a positive one charge? Uh, how, how could it do this, right? So it has two options, right? Does it change its proton numbers? Does it change its electron number? And we said before, it has to change its electron number. And, and I don't care if it has a positive one or minus one or, or what charge. So if it uh, has a minus one charge, it would have to gain an electron. And in order to get a positive one charge, it's not going to gain a proton because if it gains a proton, um, then it becomes uh, maybe neon or something. Uh, so it's it, it's not going to become a new element. So to, to how would it get a positive one charge then? What could it do? 
Well, let's go back to electrons, right? When well, you might say electrons are negative. So how could it pick up a positive one charge? It would have to lose an electron. And that makes sense, right? Uh, because um, uh, electrons are, are negative things. So if, if you get rid of something, say something bad out of your life, right? Your life becomes more positive. Uh, it's kind of the idea, right? Lose an electron and, and lose a negative and you become more positive. All right, uh, so the fundamental unit of charge is an electron. And, 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 and what does that mean? How can we use that? Well, first of all, an electron is a very small uh, unit. We actually like to use something instead uh, as a coulomb is what we like to use for our unit of charge. This is actually our SI unit of charge. Our symbol for charge is capital Q or lowercase q. And uh, capital C here is Coulomb, named after, I believe, Charles Coulomb. And, and you might say, well, why, right? Why not stick with electrons? Why do we need Coulombs? If electrons are as small as it gets uh, and, and an electron is minus one and a proton is positive one, why don't we just count that as charge? Why use Coulombs? Well, let's, let's think about it and let's look at it. So uh, I think the best way to do this maybe is to, um, is to make a table here. And uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's write right here, uh, subatomic particle. And um, let me see, I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna go probably have four columns here. And three rows underneath our title row. Something like that. Okay, so uh, subatomic particle, an atom is consisted of smaller particles that are sub, uh, that would be um, protons, neutrons, electrons, right? So let's have that over here. And why don't we go ahead and fill in the rest of these on, on the top here. Um, we'll say, uh, what is its, uh, its fundamental charge, or I think it's also called its elementary charge. Um, and then we'll also get its charge in coulombs, right? Because we're going to have to get used, used to using uh, coulombs. And we'll talk about why it, why it makes sense. And then finally, it's mass. Now, I know that we, we, we said a uh, proton has a mass of 1, a neutron has a mass of 1, an electron has a mass of 0. Um, I guess we could include that somewhere. Um, elementary charge. Uh, but, but I'm going to leave that off right now. I guess I, if you want me to write it, I'll write it right here. I'll put a 1 here. Uh, zero here and a one here. All right, so so that that is uh, I'm trying to think of what that would be. That would be maybe uh, relative mass. I'm guessing. That's kind of more of a chemistry concept, and we're not going to need that right now. Okay, so anyways, elementary charge, right? In chemistry, we refer to the proton as having a positive one charge, electron as having negative one, and neutron as zero, right? Okay, um, the, uh, the uh, charge in coulombs. Uh, it turns out that the reason we need coulombs here is because uh, that one electron is a very small charge. And so we need a unit with larger charge, right? Um, so what, what I'm saying here is one electron has a charge of uh, negative, right, because it's negative, 1.609 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Now, <clears throat> if this is the charge for electrons, then what would it be for protons? 
you might say, well, this is negative 1, and this is 1, and this is positive 1, then this would be positive 1.609 times 10 to the negative or positive 19th. Hmm. Well, yeah, you would say still negative 19th, right? Because if you change that to positive, that would make it a really large number, when in fact the charge of a proton is still a very tiny number, even though it's positive. And the charge of an electron is still a very tiny number, even though it's negative. And the charge of a neutron is going to be zero coulombs. All right, uh, mass, let's go ahead and get this because I want you to see something, right? Why did we ignore the mass of an electron? I made a comment that it's a thousand times smaller, and it is, So uh, than a proton or a neutron. So uh, this would be like if, if I was gonna go weigh myself on a scale and I had a, uh, a penny in my pocket or something, right? Would that really dramatically change the weight of, of me? Not really, right? I mean, I could take the penny out of my pocket if I wanted to, but it's pretty much the scale is going to read my correct weight. So we can just ignore the penny uh, in the same way we ignore electrons. So let's look at why. Uh, mass of a proton, 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So it's still very tiny, right? But it's it's all relative, and, 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 and that's an important idea. The mass of an electron, this is going to be a thousand times smaller. So we expect this to be uh, larger or, or smaller here, this number. Well, this is a negative, and, and because of the negative sign there, that means a very small number. So to get even smaller, this would have to be 31, right? So this is going to be 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31st. And here for the neutron, it's going to be close to the proton, right? Because this was 1 for the relative mass, and this relative mass was 1. So it should be the same, right? Well, not exactly. Um, the neutron is slightly larger. So 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27th compared to 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27th. All right, so there you have it. Um, why, why, why not use this negative one, positive one? Because uh, it's, 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 these charges are too small. We need, we need units of coulombs that, to deal with uh, the uh, objects that have more charge, right? Um, and, and, and you'll see that going forward, right? Um, why, why not use these masses? Because everything in physics was all about kilograms. So it would make sense that if we're going to talk about electrons um, going forward with electricity, we should maybe know the mass of an electron. Maybe that's useful. Maybe that'll, that'll come in handy. Um, and if not, we should still be aware of it because I guarantee in future chemistry and physics classes, um, this will come up, the mass of uh, these subatomic particles. Uh, one more thing I... All right, so I was cut off in the last video, but uh, the question I was going to ask is how many electrons is one coulomb, right? We said it's a larger unit, this, this coulomb worth of charge. And uh, so let's, let's, let's figure that out, right? Let's start with one coulomb. Let's use the conversion factor that we have now. And that is that one electron has a charge in, I'm just gonna go with the magnitude, I'm not gonna write the negative sign, but there is a negative sign, of uh, um, 1.609 um, times 10 to the negative 19th. So you can see I have this very tiny number on bottom, uh, on a one on top, and so uh, this is going to be, um, and this is in coulombs, so we're saying that one coulomb is going to be quite a few electrons, right, if we make a prediction here. So let's go ahead and cancel our units. Multiply the top across. One times one times electrons is equal to, um, uh, is equal, well, I should be careful there because of this, this uh, well, I guess I can do it. I can do it this way. So one electron divided by 1.609, nothing else on bottom, right? So one here, 1.609 times 10 to the negative 19th. And uh, no units on bottom now. And, and now I'm going to need to get my calculator out.
<clears throat> All right, so if we take one and divide by uh, this number, this very tiny number right here, 1.609 uh, EE negative 19th, <clears throat> end parenthesis, we end up getting 6.215 times 10 to the 18th electrons. So now it starts to make sense. Why do we need coulombs, right? Why can't we just talk about electron number? Well, you can see something that has one coulombs worth of charge, which is actually a fair, fairly large amount of charge, um, has uh, 6.215 times 10 to the 18th worth of electrons. All right, this is just unrealistic to deal with 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 uh, electrons as being the uh, the uh, unit of charge, right? So we we need something larger to deal with this magnitude of electrons, and and so we like to use coulombs. So this is one coulomb. This is how many electrons one coulomb is. Okay. Uh, once again, capital C for coulombs. All right. So in the second part here. We, um, before we uh, go further, there is a, a, a homework assignment that I just want to point out here. Uh, in the homework assignment, you might see questions like this where it says, uh, object A has uh, excess or deficient electrons. And object A, it says, has uh, 1 times 10 to the third, which is 1,000, 1,000 excess electrons. So if it has extra electrons, is it positive or negative? You should say negative. Object B is 1 times 10 to the 6th, which is a, a million, um, has a million, de is de deficient a million electrons. So if it's deficient electrons, this would be positive. And, uh, and so um, the question is, they, they say the quantity and kind of charge on object, or I say this is qual qu yeah, quantity and kind of charge, so is it positive or negative, on uh, the object in coulombs. So they want to know Q. Q is our symbol for charge, right? So in A, uh, I think this is uh, question seven. In, in part A, we start with um, 1,000 electrons. So I'll worry about the positive and negative sign uh, at the end. Um, we'll just go based on magnitude right here. So uh, a thousand electrons. So our conversion factor, we said that, um, well, we could use this one right here, um, or we could stick with the same one we have from before. I'm going to use the same one. But if I use that one down here, I'm going to have to put the one electron down on the bottom. All right. This one electron is 1.609 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. I can then cancel off my electrons. And this I can probably do in my head, right? Uh, this is one times 10 to the third. I just wrote it as a thousand. But when you have these numbers like this and you multiply them, you can add their exponents. So this is gonna be one times 1.609, which is just 1.609. But then we're gonna add three to negative 19, which is negative 16. Of course, times 10 to the negative 16. All right, and that's going to be our number of coulombs. Now, is it positive or negative? Well, they told us for part A that this was excess electrons. So if you have more negative things, electrons are negative, this would be uh, our, a negative charge on the object. All right, and part B, some slight changes there. It was 1 times 10 to the 6th, otherwise known as a million, right? electrons. Same conversion factor as before, 1.609 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs uh, is one electron. And this is going to be the same thing, right? We can just add the 6 to the negative 19, which is going to be, um, well, the 1 will get multiplied by 1.609, so 1 point, whoops, 1 point, she's struggling to write, 1.609 
times 10 to the, we're going to add 6 to negative 19th, so we should say negative 13th, right? Coulombs. Now, this is going to be uh, deficient uh, this many electrons, so the charge here would be positive. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. So you can see how we're using the magnitude of the charge here um, and whether or not it's missing the electrons, positive. It has excess electrons, negative. And there's parts A and B of question seven. Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, if we have objects that have, a, uh, that have charges, what happens when they interact? Now, um, when, electric when electricity was discovered, um, it was discovered by the Greeks, it was discovered by, um, or it was, it was um, experimented on in the 1700s by Ben Franklin. Um, it, it, it was discovered and, it, and worked on before we knew about uh, electrons, before we um, understood what was happening on the atomic level or the subatomic level. Uh, that we didn't gain that insight till later with Einstein, um, and uh, so so anyways in, in the in the early nineteen uh, hundreds. But um, so what did they? How did they know what happened when a positively charged object and a negatively charged object, or uh, how, how they interacted, right? And or. Uh, um, how maybe two positives interact or two negatives or a positive and a neutral or a neutral and a negative. And what they did is they experimented, right? Um, and we can actually, uh, you can see that with uh, the Greeks. Back when they, uh, they had amber, which is a fossilized tree resin, and they um, would take amber and they would, um, they would uh, rub it with a cloth or something and scrape electrons off it to give it a charge. And, um, and when this happened, um, you can see the, so, some of the history there because the, uh, the Greek word for amber is, is actually electron. And, um, and, 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 and that's, that's kind of cool, right? That this uh, fossilized tree resin was referred to as uh, an electron. And so we see, the, uh, we see this in the words electricity uh, nowadays as well. So we're still sticking with this. We're going to use this idea of, an, of running an experiment, though, to, to understand what's happening. So uh, let's, uh, let's look at two experiments here. And in the first one, all right, so uh, instead of two experiments, we're actually going to look at four. And uh, the first experiment is going to involve um, two plastic rods. Um, these rods have have not been um, have not been interacted with at all. So one is hanging um, from the ceiling, and one is just uh, brought near it. And you can see there's no. Uh, special properties of two plastic rods is just two pieces of plastic and that the um, objects are both neutral. All right, and so uh, this is experiment one. Okay, let's move on to experiment two. Experiment two is actually gonna have two parts and, and you don't have to write all this down by the way. If you just wanna um, just listen for this part, uh, the, the conclusions from these experiments are, are just kind of what we're after. So, um, and I think it'll make sense at the end. Uh, all right, so in experiment two, we have uh, two plastic rods again, but this time two glass rods as well. We're gonna take wool and, 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 and use friction, right? Uh, charging by friction. We're gonna rub the plastic rods with wool and then bring them uh, near one another. And you can see that the two rods now uh, repel each other. Both plastic rods rubbed with wool repel each other. We conduct the same experiment here with silk, uh, rub both the glass rods this time with silk, and bring them near each other, and once again, they repel each other. And um, so we can see that when objects are charged, they, they, uh, there is a force 
uh, an electric force that is going to cause the two objects to um, to repel each other. Um, all right, uh, but but is that it, right? And it's not. So let's look at experiment three. Now, what if we bring one of these charged plastic rod or plastic rods near a charged glass rod? And in fact, we see something different, right? The two rods attract each other. So the only way we can explain this, that charging an object, right, by friction, would cause two objects to repel, but then also cause two objects to attract would be by having two charges. There must be two different charges going on here. Um, and in fact, there is. The plastic rod uh, picks up a negative charge and the glass rod picks up a positive charge. Now, how, how do we know this? How do we explain it? Um, this happens because some materials are more uh, electron hungry than others. It turns out that plastic is a very electron hungry material. It was kind of like in chemistry where fluorine was the most electronegative atom and it was the hungriest atom on the periodic table, or hungriest element. Um, the same thing happens here with some of these materials being more electron hungry. So when we take wool and, and have it interact with a plastic rod, the plastic is more electron hungry and takes the electrons from the wool. Now, how many does it take? I don't, I don't, I don't know, I'm gonna go ahead and draw um, three charges here. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and draw a negative, negative, negative. And then here, I will also draw three negatives. Okay, and, and then do the same thing here, but glass is actually not very electron hungry. And silk is more electron hungry than glass. So this time, the glass is gonna be positive because it lost electrons to the silk. And so what this is showing is that two positively charged objects repel, two negatively charged objects repel. Okay, but if we, if we now draw those same charges here, we see that just like uh, the Paula Abdul song, right? Opposites attract, yep. And, uh, and so when we bring a negative and positive together, we see a force of attraction. Okay, I think I have a fourth experiment here as well on one of these pages. I had to draw these ahead of time because uh, I was using the markers and whatnot. All right, so uh, when we bring the two plastic rods near each other, I think these were the positives, right? A couple things happen. Um, if this distance is increased, the force becomes weaker. You can see this isn't tilted as much. And furthermore, if we uh, used a greater strength of uh, force to scrape electrons off of the plastic rods using the wool, we would have um, whoops, I think I used positives on the, oh, on the plastic, ah, oh, pretend you didn't see that. Ah, these should be negative signs. <clears throat> uh, how, am I, how am I gonna fix that? Ruin my drawing. This is horrible. Um, okay, well, let's see. Maybe I'll do something like that. Oh, that's kind of rough to look at. <sighs> okay, well, it's not perfect. All right, so check it out. It should be like that, right? If we scraped, because plastic is, oh, is electron hungry, if we scraped uh, harder with the wool, we would have four electrons, or four negative signs here and four negative signs here, and we would notice a, uh, a greater uh, force. So the larger the charge, the greater the force. Okay, so that's kind of sounding like um, the larger the mass, the greater the force of gravity, the larger the charge, the larger the force electric. And that actually ends up being true because uh, we'll learn this later that Coulomb's law, which is the force electric, is equal to some constant K times the charge of object one times the charge of object two divided by the distance from center to center. Aha, it looks very much like force gravity. All right, so some symmetry there in the universe between these uh, two forces. 
All right, uh, let's talk about a couple other things with these drawings. You might say, well, uh, electrons are really small. How the heck did you know that there was only four electrons lost? You know, how, how do you know that? Um, or four electrons gained in, in each of these rods? Well, um, it's not that exact, it's not an exact science. So, um, like I said, we have to uh, experiment to know which materials want to take electrons, which ones are the electron hungriest. So uh, we've actually developed something called the triboelectric series, and uh, it's in the uh, homework worksheets. Let me see if I can find it. And what this says is the most electron hungry materials are near the top, and the, and the least electron hunger, hungry materials are near the bottom. So you can see glass is near the bottom. So that's why glass, the glass rods took a positive charge because they're not very electron hungry. And celluloid is, is like, is plastic. So plastic is near the top. And so the plastic rods took those negative charges from wool. Where's wool? Right down here near the bottom. Uh, glass uh, lost electrons to silk which is above it. So whatever is near the top, the higher up on this triboelectric series uh, is more electron hungry. And whatever is closer to the bottom is less electron hungry. And um, so uh, that, that's called the triboelectric series. You'll, you'll look at that in your homework and see that. Um, but I, what I wanted to talk about was these um, charge diagrams, right? And uh, let me write that down. And they don't don't show, or maybe I, I should say what they do show. Uh, no, they don't show individual charges. Um, we we can't really know the electron. Uh, number, right? Uh, instead, what, what do they do show? They show relative amount of charge. And what I'm saying by that is um, back in uh, experiment two, we had a three negatives, right, on the plastic rod. after it was uh, rubbed by the wool. And um, because there's three negatives now on this plastic rod, there, that means that if, oh, it's kind of hard to see, but if the uh, plastic rod gained three negatives, the wool would have to um, lose three negatives and therefore is left with three positives, right? So the wool didn't necessarily uh, pick up positive charge, right? It just had three negative charges leave it and, and that's why there's three positives over here. Once again, these are not individual electrons, right? There's probably millions of electrons being scraped onto the plastic when, um, when this interaction happens. And um, so uh, the electrons that are being taken here, uh, we, we can't count the number, but we can show relative amount of charge. And this is still important, right? Because it gets at the strength, right? If I drew another negative sign here, that would be, mean a stronger amount or a, a larger amount of charge, which be, would mean a stronger force electricity, right? Because Q is proportional to force electric. Um, but it also shows something else, right? Notice that if there's three over here, there's three negatives over here, there's three positives over here. So you can't, um, so it has to balance, right? And that's called the conservation of charge. Another conservation law coming at you, yeah, all right. And, and what that means is that uh, you, uh, if you, if this object gained um, three, three negative coulombs or three electrons, then this object had to lose three coulombs or lose three electrons, right? So the charge, let me see how I can write that. The charge gained or I'll, maybe I should just say electrons 
by one object. is equal to the charge lost um, electrons, right, by the other object. <clears throat> All right, and this is gonna be very important for us uh, going forward, the idea of conservation of charge um, when we start talking about current. Uh, okay, that's good. Um, so charge diagrams just show relative amount of charge. We're not really counting electrons, and but a still useful diagram for us. Uh, okay, uh, good. Um, let's look at... Oh, and one other thing before we move on is that, um, well, I guess we'll talk about this first and then we'll go back. What about when a, uh, a neutral and a, um, a charged object interact? We didn't talk about this. Let's say um, you decide to uh, take some rabbit's fur and a balloon, right? Whoop. And maybe instead of rabbit's fur, you just use the your head, right? And you rub a balloon on your head, right? Um, well, uh, when you do that, a, uh, a, a balloon, if you look back, a rubber balloon was where on the triboelectric series. Does anybody remember? I don't know if you noticed that. Try to notice it. All right, so if you look, uh, rubber is near the top, right? And and uh, rabbit's fur is near the bottom. So uh, which one likes electrons more? Do you remember? Take a guess. It's the one near the top, right? We said the higher up on this tribal electric series, the more electron hungry. So rubber is more electron hungry. So when the two interact, right, the rabbit's fur is going to take electrons from... I'm sorry, the... And balloon is going to take electrons from the rabbit's fur. And so I drew four negatives and four positives. Furthermore, these are insulators, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, but notice that on an insulator, the charge is localized. Notice how I drew them all near the place where the interaction happened. I didn't just draw them anywhere on the balloon or draw them anywhere on the rabbit's fur, right? Um, so uh, charge doesn't spread out easily over an insulator. Charge spreads out easily over a conductor. And I'm going to talk about that before we're done here. All right, so, uh, so, so we charged up a balloon. We then take the balloon and find a wall, right? Yeah. And, um, and we turn the balloon so that the, it's this area, right? Since it's localized, this will be the area that's charged and we bring it near the wall. And somehow, this balloon sticks to the wall, right? Now, what's the charge on the wall? Is it charged at all? No, right? It's gotta be neutral. So how is this happening? Here we have a negatively charged object and a neutral object uh, causing an attraction, the balloon sticks to the wall. Eventually, the balloon falls, and that's sad, but uh, we'll talk about why. Um, let's think about why this happens, right? On the wall, and I, I don't, I'm not sure if I can draw this here. I think I can. It, since it's neutral, it has molecules with negative and positive sides. Kind of, uh, I guess you could think about like water being a polar molecule, even the, even a nonpolar molecule which is probably what the wall is, doesn't, it has some unbalance of charge, right? It has a slightly, even if it's only just very slightly. So I'm drawing these neutral molecules in the wall. Well, what happens when this balloon is brought near here? I'll draw one more, what the heck? Is that the wall moves 
these molecules in the move, <laughs> in the, this, these molecules in the wall all turn their their negative their their negative end away from these negative charges. They turn their positive end towards the the negative charges, right? Because opposites attract and like charges repel. And 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 so what you see is uh is all these molecules. If I can draw this uh, again down here. Sticking with four negative charges, trying to draw that. We can see that those molecules all turn their positive end. And you might say, well, how does that matter? And, and it does because we have here, you know, millions of electrons interacting here with, uh, you know, millions of molecules on the wall. And even though it's a tiny force, when you have so many molecules doing this, it ends up being a significant enough force for, to, uh, to ignore the force of gravity, right? That this balloon will cause uh, an attraction here that the balloon will stick to the wall and uh, and the force of gravity is ignored, right? So what's that say? Well, that says that the force of electricity must be stronger or weaker than force gravity. Well, obviously stronger, right? And if you come back to this, uh, this equation, which is called Coulomb's Law, we can see why. Uh, big G is equal to um, 8 point... Uh, um, is it 8.99? I'm confusing my constants now. No, um, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. And K is equal to 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. And so this is on a magnitude of, what, 20 powers of 10 larger for K? So force electricity is way stronger than force of gravity. Like, uh, and, and so what you see here then is that the balloon sticks to the wall, ignores this gravitational force, and um, yeah, and, and, and you're happy because the balloon stuck to the wall. Now this won't last forever, right? Eventually the balloon falls. And why is that? Because there are electron hungry uh, molecules in the, in the air, right? The water wants these electrons too. So we see that we notice things like static electricity, um, more in the winter when the air is drier, when there's less humidity in the air. And, um, and, and sticking a balloon to the wall works better in the winter, not so much uh, in, the, in the summer. All right, uh, so, um, so that's it. We can look at one more uh, thing there, which is, uh, and I guess I can show this, when, um, if we were drawing a free body diagram, of this balloon, right? We would say that there is a uh, there is a repulsive force between the electron, the the negative charge here, and the negative ends of these molecules, right? And you might say, well, wouldn't that push these two objects away from each other? While there's an attractive force between these negative, the negative charge here, and the positive ends of these molecules that attract. And, and, and you might say, well, wouldn't that just cancel then, right? Because you have two ends, you have the negatives repelling the negatives, so these are objects are pushing each other apart, and then you have the negatives um, near the positives, which should say attract, and you might say the balloon shouldn't do anything. Well, that's very astute if you caught that, but the, the reason why that doesn't happen is because of the distance, right? When objects are closer together, that force is stronger. So when we have the negative and positives interact, the uh, force on the balloon is going to be towards the wall, right? Being stronger than when the negatives and negatives interact and push these objects apart, that that object pushing the, uh, the balloon away from the wall is going to be smaller. And we have a smaller force battling a larger force. And so we say that the net force is going to point which way? You should say to the right or towards the wall, right? And so this is why um, even though we have, we, we know opposites attract and like charges repel, that the balloon still sticks to the wall. 
Okay, there we go. Um, all right, lastly, I, I mentioned insulators and, uh, and conductors. And, and I just want to talk about this because I know it's going to show up in the homework. And uh, in, in the big idea here is that uh, there's some materials that um, allow their electrons to move easily and some materials that don't. So what we covered so far was uh, insulators, right? So insulators are, are um, don't allow electrons to move easily. So this took some work here, right? Some some rubbing by charging by friction, some charging by rubbing to scrape electrons from one material to the other to um, get those. Uh, electrons to to go to the plastic from the wool right and so uh, conductors are things like um, uh, rubber glass uh, wood um, things like this that don't allow electron movement uh, easily uh, plastic I'm sorry, these are insulators, yeah. Okay, conductors do allow electrons to move easily. So that means that if for, and this is metal, right? Metals do this, metals like uh, copper, it's an excellent conductor. Um, if, if four electrons, if this was a piece of metal, and four electrons were scraped onto the, the piece of metal, or if somehow we were able, four electrons, four negative charges, we would see these negative charges spread out. Because negatives are, uh, are, are not attracted to each other, so they spread out when they can. And on a conductor, that charge can spread out. And um, so this is referred to as a, uh, you can think of metals as being a sea of electrons. So what do I mean by that? Well, the atoms in a piece of metal don't readily hold their electrons well. And, 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 and so they allow their electrons to move about like they're in a sea of electrons is, is the way I've heard it described in, in chemistry classes. Um, and, and, and so uh, two different types of materials here, uh, electrons moving easily on conductors like metal uh, and insulators not allowing electrons to move easily. And we saw that where the balloon was only charged uh, by the part that that interacted, right? It was only charged um, locally, right? I think I drew that right here, right? That the negative charge, I had to turn the balloon to, to face the wall, and just that part of the balloon is charged up. Uh, would the electrons move on the balloon if they could? Heck yeah, right? They don't want to be near each other. They're all negatives, and they repel each other. But, but because they uh, can't move easily, they all hang out in one spot on an insulator. Okay, um, I think that's about all I, I want to share. Uh, got some worksheets for you to practice online, and uh, hopefully you can get through them, and um, hopefully this is making sense. All right, uh, that's, all, that's it. Take care. All right, one more thing before we go. Um, I just uh, wanted to show you this really quick. I took some paper, tore it up into little bits. Um, what charge does paper have? Uh, you should say um, it's neutral, right? So if I take my pen here, take uh, my sweatshirt, and scrape some of the electrons off of my sweatshirt onto the pen, and bring that over the paper, maybe you can see some of the attraction there, right, from polarizing this uh, paper, I'm able to lift the paper off the table just by bringing the pen near. I'm not sure how easy that is to see. <laughs> One more.
more time. Oh yeah, that was a good one. Okay, so not a perfect example, but at least you get the idea. This charged pen and this neutral paper will interact. Ooh, that time I took some paper with it. Okay, have a good day.